So let's go back and look at the ties that I talked about earlier. Student, student. Is that a strong tie or a weak tie? Think about that. Well, if the two students are really, really good friends and they hang out all the time, yes, it's a strong tie. But for the most part, most of the people in your courses are weak ties. Elected politician to a citizen. Think about it. Strong tie or weak tie? Is it possible that the citizen's really good friends with the elected uh, uh, politician? Sure. But for the most part, most citizens and their elected politicians are weak ties. Elected officials give us access to what's going on in Sacramento or what's going on in Washington, D.C. As a citizen, you can call up your elected official and say, dude, you're my weak tie. Help me out. Bridge me to that community in Sacramento. I need something to happen at the state level politics. You're my elected official. You know, you're using that weak tie to bridge your life and your community with what's going on in Sacramento. So that would be considered a weak tie. Student teacher relationship. Again, some students and teachers become real good buddies, but for the most part, the student-teacher relationship is a weak tie. And if you remember, the way we're defining weak tie is something that bridges communities. So as a teacher, I have, I'm in a, a community of sociologists. You are not. I'm bringing my community of sociologists to you and sharing information. That's what weak ties do. They share information. Sometimes that information, if we define it loosely, can be something like a disease. Okay. So now that we understand strong ties and weak ties, we have a sense of organizational structures. Let's look at networks. This right here is a diagram of terrorist networks. These are all of the flights that were involved in 9-11. A sociologist took the names of all the terrorists and he looked at how they were networked with each other. You should see one name that looks familiar, hopefully um, Mohammed Atta is a real central player in the terrorist networks that were involved in 9-11. And sociologists try to reconstruct these networks to understand how information flows through these networks, what network, um, how information flows, how, how money flows through these networks, and how they work, and how we can stop them. So this is one example of a network. It's a combination of strong and weak ties. You've seen this image already. This is um, a friendship network. Sociologists examine how people um, are networked together for friendship. You know, if you've got a friend and some, you know, this group on the left does babysitting with each other. This group on the right um, has classes together. We look at how networks change over time. We look at um, what would happen if one person left the network. We look at um, how resources are shared. If uh, suddenly a fight broke out, we look at how the networks played a part in the, in the violence or the, the riot that emerged. So here are two images for you that I want you to imagine. Imagine you've got two networks, network A and network B. Network A is all strong ties. Now remember, what are strong ties? They, they're all about loyalty and respect and obligation. These are your best friends. These are your, your family members. So we have two networks, A and B, that are all strong ties. So just think about this for a moment. What are the advantages and disadvantages of, of, these, of this network structure? What can they do? What can they not do? Why would network A and network B either have social order or not have social order? Think about it. Now, you know, you might need a little bit of context for this, so I'll give you a little bit of context. Imagine these are two different networks at school. You've got group A, they're all good friends, but they have no overlapping membership with group B. New, group A is all, you know, unto itself, strong ties. They don't have any members in Group B. Same thing with Group B. So imagine these two high school groups that have no overlapping memberships, and they're just, you know, this clique of good friends, A and B. They might, you know, a group member from Group A and a group member from Group B, they might bump into each other in the cafeteria. One person might step on another person's toe. Uh, one person might look at another person in another group. But what do you think might happen? Here's another context situation for you. What if Group A is a tribe in Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, a family tribe, and then you've got Group B, a family tribe, all strong ties. What would you predict? What would they be able to accomplish in terms of social order? How, how would they cooperate? Why wouldn't they cooperate? Would these two tribes, you know, get into a war? Why would they? Why wouldn't they? So I want you to think about these networks. What would happen if there were all strong ties, no overlapping membership? 
The next diagram is a mix of strong and weak ties. The red dots are strong ties for group A. The blue, tie, the blue dots are strong ties for group B. But you've got these new dots, the green ones. And the green ones have overlapping membership. They have connections with people in the other group. This puts the green dots in a very, very important position because they can help group A and group B communicate. So for this, for this diagram, I want you to think about what happens when you have strong ties and weak ties and the networks are now overlapping. What's advantageous about it? What's disadvantageous? What elements might push things towards social order? What elements might push things towards social disorder? So again, I like for you to think about um, our, our model here. We've got macro level, internal states, individual action, macro level outcome. So here's, let's draw the theory. You've got two groups, but there's ties across groups. There's weak ties creating you know, a bridge between the two groups. The argument here is that these ties across groups are creating trust across the groups. Think about it. Let's say you're in group A and you know somebody who's friends with somebody in group B and you say you know I was about to uh, date this girl in group B should I trust that group and the person would say yeah I know that group I'm friends with them I talk to them I borrow money from them and I buy things from their stores yeah I trust them they're, they're good people so ties across groups can make people feel trust internally it can also help people share information so if you are in group A and somebody in group B looks at you a certain way, you might say, oh, that person's looking at me rudely. But the person who, the green dot, the person who's connected to both groups, will say, actually, in their culture, that look means that um, they think you're a nice guy. You're interpreting their behavior incorrectly. So you've got new information, which creates trust. So the idea here is that ties across groups give, it, give you information about the other group, which creates trust, which is going to lead to acts that reduce conflict and ultimately lead to social order. There's an article in our textbook about ethnic conflict in civil society and it argues that in cities where there are voluntary associations only include members of one religious group, religious violence is, is high. So imagine for a moment that there was a, a hunting club and it only consisted of Protestants and there was a fishing club and it only consisted of Catholics. The idea here is that when you have a hunting club, a fishing club, um, a Qantas club, an Elks club, any sort of club where there's only one religious group, it can lead or it can contribute to higher violence. The other flip side is that voluntary associations where there was a mixture of Muslims and Hindus, there was low levels of violence. This goes back to what we were just talking about. When you've got those weak ties acting as bridges, it can help create peace and foster peace and keep violence low rather than high. For those of you who don't know, I'm sorry if I forgot to mention this, um, Muslims and Hindus don't get along in India, if you didn't know that. So think about this. Why would conflict not escalate? Think about the escalation of violence and how would this maintain social order. What is it about weak ties that creates social order? Why are weak ties so important? And on the other hand, why are strong ties important? So keep those questions in mind. We'll be talking about those. Last thing I want to talk about before we stop was I want to go back to the football game. You've got Team A, Team B. We're going back to organizational structure. Now we know something about strong ties and weak ties. We know something about networks. Sociologists have found that it's very common for violence to escalate at sporting events. And I want to explain to you why, because it really brings together a lot of our tools for social order. Imagine you're at a football game, drinking beers, having a good time. And you turn your head, and then you look back, and you see your best friend being punched in the face. What's your reaction? Well, your best friend is a strong tie you see your best friend getting punched, you immediately want to do something, right? You're not going to just sit back and do nothing. So your strong tie impulse pulls in. Loyalty, honor, respect for your best friend, 
the, the very definition of friendship comes to play here, the meaning of friendship. So you've got strong ties, you've got meanings, somebody just punched your friend. Now, you notice that the person who punched your friend is wearing sports paraphernalia from the other team. You're at a Chargers game and they're wearing Pittsburgh Steelers clothing. Well, the reason why violence escalates at sporting events is because if you see one Chargers fan punch one Steelers fan, suddenly you, you start to realize who is a friend and who is a foe. Because everyone's wearing their jersey with their colors saying, look, I'm on this side, look, I'm on that side, and the violence starts to escalate. You don't even need to know the context. You saw somebody with the opposing team's jersey, their fans, punching your friend, you punch them. So then it starts to escalate. The Pittsburgh Steelers fans say, whoa, the Chargers fans are attacking us. So the Chargers fans start attacking the Pittsburgh fans, and it keeps on escalating and escalating, unless security can stop it before it escalates. But if security doesn't stop it, it'll escalate until there's a riot, where you know fans from one side are fighting the fans from the other side. They don't know why. And it's because strong ties are in motion, Meaning is in motion, and another meaning that we have to realize is that if you can easily identify who the bad guy is, it's easy to get for violence to escalate. Because you look and it's like, oh look, they're wearing red, we're wearing green. Okay, punch them. They're wearing red. Those are the bad guys. So this is one of the reasons why violence escalates. Okay, so we're going to stop here, and um, when we come back, we will talk about basically preparing for the exam. I relaxed in 